Okay, so it is seven o'clock now, and uh, I want to welcome you all to Elk Grove Village Public Library and virtually. <laughs> and I'm glad that we can do the programs this way. Um, I'm so glad that we have Karen Chan here uh, to talk about 12 months to take charge of your finances. And this is the first in a four part series that we're doing with Karen. So January's tonight, and uh, we'll be doing three more months, February's February, March, and April's meetings will all be with Karen on different topics. Um, I think that um, I emailed those topics out to you, or you can check our Elkhart Village Library website under the events calendar to see those topics. Um, and then also Karen's website, karenchan.com. Is it Karen it's, Chan? It, it's Karen Chan Financial Ed com. Karen Chan Financial Ed com. She also has all of her um, her upcoming uh, webinar or upcoming presentations listed there, which include our library ones there as well. So um, uh, anyway, thank you all for joining us. And Karen, thank you for being here. I will um, be monitoring the chat and I will then turn it over to you. Actually, I was going to introduce you a little bit, but Karen, I'll just let you introduce yourself. <laughs> That's fine. That's okay. fine. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, I really appreciate uh, Elk Grove Village Library thinking that that financial topics are important enough to, to devote these these four sessions to. And what a great way to kick off uh, the new year, talking about 12 months to take charge of your finances. I, I did want to acknowledge that um, people, I think, fall into one of two camps when it comes to, um, to New Year's resolutions. People either always make a New Year's resolution or people have given up on them. Whichever camp you're in, I hope that you'll think of tonight as not so much making a resolution, setting a goal without having a plan behind it, but rather having tools that may help you do the things about your finances that you may have been wanting to do for some time. And so um, to tell you just a, just a bit about me, I am a certified financial planner. However, I do not practice, meaning I do not take clients. I use that training, I hope, to do a better job as an educator on some of the same topics that a practicing financial planner might help their clients with. I've been doing personal finance education for 27 years. Um, the first 18 of those, almost 19, were with the University of Illinois Extension. And since so-called retiring <clears throat> in 2012, I've continued to do the same type of work, but independent now, uh, as opposed to under the umbrella of the university. I do want to point out that today's program is education and it's not advice. Now, tonight's program is a little different from a lot of things that I teach. Typically, I'm covering what I call content. I'm teaching you concepts and helping you understand things like income taxes or the tools you use to do estate planning. Those are two of the topics we'll be doing at future programs. Tonight is more of me telling you what to do. Not that I'm giving you advice, but I'm going to recommend actions that you can take to get familiar with your financial situation so that you're in a better position then to make decisions for yourself. But still, I will say that today is education. I'm not giving advice about um, about investments. I'm not giving advice about uh, uh, taxes or, or wills and trusts or any of that sort of thing. You may, after tonight, decide that you do actually need some uh, professional assistance with some aspect of your finances. And so I encourage you, you know, to look for a qualified professional uh, for those things that you may feel you need some, some guidance on. So the backbone of tonight's program is the money calendar. Uh, and I believe Nancy uh, sent each of you the, the handout, which is um, it's made from some of the, uh, the slides that I'll be showing you tonight. It's intended to walk you through the 12 tasks, the 12 topics that I um, think that investigating them will put you on better footing, knowing where you stand uh, with regard to various aspects of your finances. Now, if you're an overachiever, it's not going to take you 12 months to do this. You might knock it out in, I don't know, 12 weeks, uh, you know, four, four or five months, whatever, whatever pace is comfortable for you. But 
I always think of this as the way I was taught that you eat an elephant. Now, when I was doing this program face to face before the pandemic, I would always ask how many of you know how to eat an elephant. And I was amazed that very few people knew how. So I'm going to clue you in on this. You eat an elephant one bite at a time. In other words, you focus on the individual pieces that you can do and don't let yourself get overwhelmed at what you might feel being a, a task that's a little bit large for you. But here's how I would like to get started. You know, you had a lot of other things that you could have done tonight with your time uh, instead of being here with Nancy and me. So I'd like you to reflect for a moment and on your handout, if you printed it out, or if you didn't, find a piece of paper somewhere to do this. I'd like you to write down what it is that drove you to come tonight. What is the goal you have that you hope to be able to accomplish regarding your finances? It may be a few words, it may be a few sentences, but I'm going to be quiet while you think about what is your goal and actually write it down. Silence is relatively uncomfortable in a face-to-face -face program. It's even more uncomfortable virtually. Um, I may or may not have given you enough time to make your notes. If I didn't, please, you know, as we go along, continue uh, to add um, to your goal. Um, if you're finished, uh, that's great. I hope that this will, th there's, there's a purpose behind my having you do this. There truly is research that shows if you write down a goal, you are much more likely to achieve it. And so that's why I wanted you not only to think about it, to put, but to put it in writing. And some other things that I'm going to ask you to do are to download some worksheets and, and use links to other tools that I'm going to tell you about. I've given you um, here on this slide a very specific link that will take you directly to this. Um, but I'll also at the end tell you uh, how to find it if you don't happen to come across this particular link uh, when you need it. Um, so tools are going to be important, largely worksheets. Uh, they're going to come from two sources. Uh, there's a publication from the Department of Labor called fin Savings Fitness, which I've shown the cover of here. Um, it has a lot of great information, but I'm going to ask you to focus on the, the appendix where they ha have several worksheets that will be ideal for the things we're going to talk about tonight. Um, but there were other topics that they didn't have worksheets that I would like you to have, and so I've made those. Uh, they're posted typically in Word format. Some of them might be in PDF uh, on the web page that I'll be directing you to for this. So um, just know that there are a number of tools I'm going to refer to tonight. They're all in one page, on one page uh, on my website to make it easy for you to, to locate those. One tool that I cannot give you that I think would be helpful is if you have a buddy who might want to go down this path with you. If you have someone else that maybe is attending tonight that's a, you know that's a friend of yours, maybe somebody who's not uh, but would be willing to, um, to tackle some of these tasks uh, for themselves and you guys could kind of keep each other motivated, I think that would be ideal. And the final tip that I will give you is whether it's a paper folder or it's a folder on your computer, or maybe you'll need both, having one place that you're going to keep all of the information and worksheets that you're doing uh, as you tackle the tasks we're going to discuss tonight. And what are those tasks? Well, they're focused on 12 different aspects of your finances. We're going to walk through these tonight. Uh, so we'll start with where your money goes. We'll talk about how you plan to spend your money. We'll talk about what you owe, your credit history, and on from there to retirement and estate planning and so forth. 
for each month, as you'll see in the uh, money calendar that uh, that Nancy sent to you, for each month, you've got a checklist. Starts with the purpose. Why am I asking you to do this? Second, it will tell you what tools you need, whether it's a worksheet, a calculator, some records of your own, what have you, what the actual task or tasks are that I'm asking you to do that month. And then the last two boxes of the checklist are uh, have space for you to write, because this is where the real learning takes place. Once you've done the task for that month, I want you to reflect and say, what did I learn uh, about my situation related to this topic? And based on what you learned, are there next steps that you see that you should be taking? And if so, what are they? So you've got space to actually make those kinds of notes on your money calendar. Oh, I backed up because I wanted to point out um, up here in the corner, um, you may, you'll notice the square that has a check mark in it. Um, your boxes will be empty. They will not have a check mark. That's another place I want you to keep yourself motivated. I want you to check off the things that you have done uh, to give yourself credit and to encourage your brain to want to keep going. So month one, I want you to focus on expenses. And I'm just going to use this as sort of an example here. Um, I'm going to talk about my friend Pat who um, was anxious to do this month's task in particular. She does want to know where her money goes, but she also has a very specific question. She wants to know how much she's spending on all of this communication stuff, whether it's internet, telephone, um, cell phone, maybe even a Zoom subscription uh, now, uh, all of these communication things that we have. She needs to know how much she's spending there. What she's going to need is, perhaps copies of her bills, uh, either access to her checking and credit card statements online or paper ones if you still get those, maybe receipts, and a worksheet where you're going to pull that information together uh, for your monthly expenses. And your task is to take that worksheet and going back historically, looking back one month, so at this point, maybe looking at December, um, and pulling together, recreating where your money went over that four or four and a half week period. You'll notice that you have, um, I gave you columns for different types of expenses. I want you to not just know how much you spent, but on what categories of expenses uh, they went. And once you've done this, then the task for you will be, what did you learn and what your next steps are? Now, my friend Pat, as I said, uh, had a particular question, not just in general where her money goes, but how much was she paying specifically for all of these communications things. What she learned when she looked back over the previous month and tallied it all up, she found out that she spends $195 a month on this. Now, for a family, maybe even for a couple, um, Pat feels like that might be appropriate, but she's a single person uh, with a relatively modest income, and she feels like that's just a bit too much and that there should be something she can do about that. So for her, the next steps are to call the providers of these different services, find out whether she's still under a contract, and if so, when is it up? What options she has, even if she is on a contract, could she step down to a lower level of service that might still meet her needs? Um, and she's going to start comparing with other providers, um, thinking about when she is free to move elsewhere, uh, what she may choose to do at that point. And I'll tell you that for that last step, the place she's probably going to go is to the library's website where I expect your Elk Grove uh, Village Library has access to all of Consumer Reports online materials. And you can do research, and Pat will do this, you know, to research the various cell phone providers and so forth. So month one is looking back to the previous month and trying to recreate where your money went. It's kind of the quick and dirty way to get yourself started here. And in month two, I'm going to ask you to use that information to create a spending plan. You're also going to actually track expenses in month two, so that at the end of the month, you can compare your plan with what you actually ended up spending over the course of that month.
So what you're going to need is there's this wonderful cash flow spending um, sheet in the savings fitness book that I mentioned. Uh, it's intended for you to create your spending plan here. And even though I've just given you this little snapshot of, of one spending category here, um, based on what you saw your spending was the previous month, to make a projection of what you think you'll spend the next month. Some expenses aren't monthly, they're annual, so you've got a column to put those in. At the end of the month, after you have tracked your actual spending for those weeks, you can enter that, make a note. Did you actually spend more than you planned? Did you spend less? What kind of adjustments do you need? So this is sort of an iterative process. You know, you're going to create the quick and dirty history of how you spent your money in month one. Month two, you're going to buckle down and do it a little more carefully by tracking expenses in real time. And to help you with the tracking of those expenses, there's another sheet. It, to be honest, it's the same sheet as what you used in month one when you and where when you were just recreating your expenses for the entire month. But in real time, it's a little hard to work on the same sheet uh, for four weeks. And so typically people will use four of these one per week, total up their expenses in each category at the end of the week. One of the advantages of doing that at the end of the week is if there's a spending category that's really kind of out of, way out there compared to what you thought you were spending, it lets you figure that out after one week instead of a month so you can begin to make adjustments. So you'll make a note at the end of the month. What did you learn? Well, you may learn things when you do your spending plan. Initially, at the beginning of the month, you might find that you're spending more than uh, your income. You might find that there are some spending areas that look like an issue. And then you'll need to decide, you know, what are your next steps? Some people decide to track their expenses for a few more months just to make sure they've really got a handle on things. Somebody might tackle a particular spending area uh, where they feel like they need to get things under control. So month three, we're going to move to the topic of what do you owe? And I'm just going to point out here that we end up in debt for one simple reason. And it is that we have spent more than our income. That's what creates debt. Now, sometimes it's very intentional. We take on a mortgage so we can buy a house. The house is worth more than the cash we had on hand. A mortgage is the way we obtain the additional money to buy the house. Same thing with a car. Same thing with a college education. Um, but it's important to know what you do owe so that you have a realistic picture of those debts. And if needed, you can develop a realistic plan for paying them down. The tools for this month, uh, in the Savings Fitness uh, book, there is an excellent one-page form where you will list each of your creditors, the interest rate for those debts, the balance for each one, the required monthly payment. You may be paying a different monthly amount, either because you've negotiated or because you're trying to get it paid off. And, and you may feel that some of these debts have more priority than others. Um, but you pull this information together so that you've got an accurate picture of how much you owe, to whom, and at what interest rates. Here's the, the thing that you may not know about. There's this great tool called PowerPay. Uh, it's from uh, Utah State University Extension partner uh, organization to the sister organization to the Illinois uh, Extension that I worked for. They created this online tool, and it's also available as an app for Apple phones, where that very information that we just talked about, uh, the balances on each of your, your debts, the payment that you're making, the interest rate, you can put that in PowerPay, and it will help you do a few different things. The first thing it does, and you can see that I created this example a while ago. I need to go back and redo this. Um, but you can see that it told us. Uh, based on the inputs, how long it was going to take to pay off each of these debts. And you'll notice that one is likely to be paid off in five months, but the next one's going to take almost six years to pay off. Okay, what do I do with that information? Well, PowerPay is going to show you what will happen if 
when you pay off this first debt, which is only $25 a month. And so a lot of us, when we paid that off, what would we say to ourselves? Oh, well, if it was normal times, we'd say, goody, goody, gun drops. I have an extra $25. I can go out to lunch at work an extra day this week or this month. Well, one, you may not be going to the office to work anymore. Two, there aren't very many places to go eat. You're probably getting takeout. Uh, but the point here is, instead of letting that $25 just sort of trickle through your fingers, commit that you're going to take it and add it to the monthly payment you're making on one of the other debts. For example, we've got this, um, we've got this crown, I made up these names, you've got this crown first, you know, loan or credit card here, that it's not too long, two years and a half till you get it paid off. Its payment is also only $25 a month. Tell PowerPay that you want to put that extra $25 a month you've got now because you paid off Maxter. You want to put that toward your Crown First card. You're going to be paying $50 a month now. It'll show you how fast you're going to get that paid off. And then when it's paid off, you'll agree that you're going to put that $50 now toward probably your VIP card who has the god awful interest rate here, 29%, and get it paid off. This example, this real example here where it looked like it was going to take almost six months to get out of debt, following that power pay approach that I just described, this person could actually be out of debt in about two and a half years. And the beauty of it is they're, they're simply keeping the same budget that they've been on. They've been making these payments on time already up to this point. They're just paying out the same amount. They're just being careful that as they pay off debts, they redirect the dollars purposely uh, to pay off the remaining ones. So I encourage you to give this, uh, to give this tool a shot. And the link directly to it uh, is at karenchanfinancialed.com under resources and look for 12 months to take charge of your finances. Everything that I'm talking about here, you can either click and go to a web page or click and download uh, whatever forms uh, I've talked about here. So month four, if we've got debt, that probably means we have a credit history. So month four, I want you to learn what information is on your credit report by actually getting it. And if there are problems with your credit report, may have a plan for improving that credit history. The only thing you're going to need here is uh, either internet access or a telephone and go to annualcreditreport.com or call this phone number and ask for your free annual credit reports. Now, there is something special going on right now. Th through this service, because of the pandemic, the three credit reporting agencies have agreed that if you go online to annualcreditreport.com, you'll be able to access free weekly credit reports up through April 2021. And so whereas normally we only have one free annual report at this time, you can get them free weekly. We, nobody needs it weekly, but it means that you can check it now, and if you're trying to improve your payment history and so forth, you'll be able to go back in just a couple of months and see how you're doing with that. When you do get the copies of your credit report, um, there are three major credit reporting agencies. You can get all three at once. You can get one at a time. It doesn't matter. Once you've gotten one for your annual report, the 12 months starts ticking for that particular company's credit report. So TransUnion, Equifax, Experian. Each one that you get, look for any information that is incorrect, like your address is wrong, your name is wrong, um, incomplete, my husband and I once, uh, we, were, we were trying to buy the home that we currently live in and discovered that they still showed us owing the full balance on our previous mortgage, which had been paid off when we sold the house. That was incomplete information that was very important. Uh, or there may be stuff that's out of date. Um, so look for anything that's incorrect and follow the instructions that will come with your credit report about how to dispute it. And don't dilly-dally too long about doing that um, because typically you only have like a 30-day window uh, to dispute information on any given credit report because information is updated and changes uh, so frequently. 
You might also consider putting a fraud alert uh, if warranted or even freezing your credit report um, if you're concerned about identity theft. And that's something that we're also going to be talking about more in detail in one of the um, other programs in this series where we're going to be talking about credit reports, credit scores, and identity theft protection. Moving on to month five, month five. Now, we've already looked at what do I owe. Now let's look at the flip side of that. What do you own? So you're going to identify all of your financial assets, uh, tally up their value, and then you'll be able to ask yourself some questions like, you know, in an emergency, how much do I have that I could actually access? And unfortunately, some of you may have had to uh, already deal with that if you have uh, had a reduction in income or become unemployed uh, because of the pandemic that we're still uh, living through. Um, so your main tool here is going to be yet another worksheet uh, that you can download uh, where by category, you'll, I've asked you to list the things that you own, your financial assets. Some of them will fall under the cash category. That's where your checking account, your savings account, savings bonds, CDs that are not you know, too far out as far as their uh, maturity date. A section for you to list all of your retirement accounts, IRAs and 401ks and so forth. Um, any other investments not inside retirement accounts and then personal use assets, which are your home, your car, uh, maybe you have a nice piece of jewelry, maybe you have a nice piece of art somewhere in your house. And so just as every other month, once you've made your list of the things that you own, there may be some ahas, some realizations that you had. Make note of those. And what are the next steps that you think you might want to do? Maybe it suddenly occurs to you that, you know, I always, I was always going to bump up my contribution to that 401k plan and I never did it. Well, this may be your wake-up call to remind you to get that done. Now, in month six, you're going to combine that list of debts that you created with that list of what you own that you made in month five, and we're gonna put them together into what's called a net worth statement or a financial balance sheet. There are several wor different words that you'll see this go by. The net worth statement is a great tool for assessing your overall financial situation. And it gives you a baseline to measure progress um, or no progress uh, down the road. It's kind of like going to the doctor's office and every time they make you get on that scale, you know. Um, and when you get on that scale, whether it's at the doctor's office or at home, I'm guessing there's, there's a one big question in your mind. Well, two. One is, what's the number today? But even more importantly is, which direction did I go since last time? It's the same way with net worth. The actual number that you come up with is important. You know, what are you worth financially? But also, did it increase since last time? Did it stay the same? Did it go down? It's a way for you to keep track overall uh, with your financial position that way. So to do this, you're going to pull information from that debt reduction worksheet that I already told you about the what do I own worksheet from month five. And there's a form in the savings fitness book uh, where you'll sort of summarize uh, the information from that list of assets that you already did in month five. And then you're going to subtract the liabilities from your assets. The difference is your net worth. It's really pretty simple to do. And I will tell you that um, my husband has kind of gotten hooked on this. Um, I don't remember how many years ago it was I did our first net worth statement. And he's actually at the point now where periodically he will say, well, actually, when he was working under threat of layoff, which in his industry went on for years, I could always tell when he thought layoffs were coming because he would come home and say, can you do a report for me? He'd learned that it was a way for him to see where we stood. And, and in his case, I think we were lucky that it was able to give him some reassurance that if he did get laid off, it wasn't the end of the world because um, we'd been tracking this and knew, knew where we stood. Now, month seven is going to be about the, the big financial question that comes up later in our lives, which is, what is our retirement income going to look like? Now, you're probably in one of two groups. You're either a pre-retiree 
far enough away from retirement that your question at this point is how much I need to be saving to end up in a good position when retirement comes, or you're in retirement or getting close enough to retirement that there's not a whole lot you can do, but your question at this point is how much do I think I'll be able to spend and not run out of money? There are some excellent online calculators that will help you with this. Um, there's one from T. Rowe Price, which is a mutual fund company. And I didn't write out the whole URLs here on the slide. It is in its entirety in your handout, and it will also be in its entirety, obviously, uh, on my webpage. Um, the T. Rowe Price one, though, is sort of multi-purpose. It will work for both pre-retirees and those who are in retirement. Vanguard, another mutual fund company, um, has specific calculators, one for pre-retirees and one for retirees, uh, to help you play around with sliders and let you see where you stand. Now, before you do any of these, you if you haven't seen an estimate of your Social Security benefits for a while, you'll probably want to go to Social Security first, set up a My Account at the Social Security website, um, where you can request a statement uh, projection of your benefits. Um, and just a heads up, if you haven't set up that account yet with Social Security, if your credit report is frozen, you won't be able to set up my account because the identity verification questions that they're going to ask you are pulled from, and I apologize, I can't remember, I think it's, I think it's Experience uh, database. And so you would have to unfreeze your credit report in order for Social Security to be able to conduct the identity verification that they want to do before you'll, you can actually set up your My Account with them. Now, back to these other calculators um, that will help you look at what your retirement income may be down the road. Um, this is a screenshot of the uh, pre-retiree calculator from, from Vanguard, and it's actually kind of neat. Um, you see the impact in real time of the changes in the inputs that you give it. So my friend Pat, going back to her, uh, Pat played around with this. And so she moved this slider to say I'm 35 and she moved the other slider to say I'm gonna retire at 65. She put her current annual income at 30,000. I told you, you know, she has a pretty moderate income. How much does she save annually for retirement? She felt a little embarrassed, but she said, you know, it's $800. How much have you already saved? Well, in a previous job where she was making more money, uh, she accumulated a fair amount for her age. Um, what percent of your income do you think you'll need in retirement? Now, this 85% is the default that Vanguard gives you. Um, you could play around with that and see what it does to your results if you thought that you needed more or could live on less than that. And what your expected average rate of return on your a savings that you have for retirement will be. Now, I asked you to get your Social Security benefit estimate first. It's so that you can check this box and put the amount right here so that this calculator can take that into consideration. If you also have a pension that you're going to be getting, you can check the box for that and include that amount as well. Now, over here on the right hand side, these two bar graphs are your results. The first one with the green and orange boxes shows Pat what she is already expected to have as far as monthly income in retirement. The orange box is from her Social Security benefit. The green box is how much they project she'll be able to take out each year from her, uh, I'm sorry, per month from her retirement savings. The blue box, on the other hand, is what she is projected to need in retirement. I think it's pretty clear that Pat is not on track to have sufficient income in retirement. So what should Pat do? A, freak out. B, get a second job. <laughs> freak out is the wrong answer. Actually, what Pat should do is she should start playing around with this calculator and figuring out what the impact of reasonable changes will be for her. One of them is Pat's one of those people that kept saying she was going to increase her contribution to her 401k and she has not done it. So she comes over to the slider for her annual 
uh, savings for retirement and moves that from 800 to 1200 and immediately can she can see the impact over here on the right and then she has a little aha moment realizing that there's also a company match on that twelve hundred dollars which it, it they match 50 cents on the dollar so that means she's really saving eighteen hundred dollars uh, a year not just twelve hundred so she moves that slider again and she can see the changes over here because she's relatively early in her career even small changes like that will have pretty significant uh, impacts on on the outcome here so you start looking at what changes you can make pat might even decide she needs to go back into a field that has a little bit higher higher income for her if you're in retirement or very close to retirement you'll use this calculator and you don't have very many sliders. Your sliders are how long should your portfolio last? That's a very tactful way of saying how long do you think you'll live? Um, the second slider is how much is in your portfolio today, all of your investments. Uh, and this you would pull from your net worth statement, but removing your home, your car, other personal use assets. And then asking how much you think you'll need to spend from your portfolio each year. It gives you this somewhat complicated looking graph here, but but over on the right, this 72%, this is your this is your part that you want to pay attention to. It's telling you that for the time frame you selected, which is going out 30 years, if you look at the bottom of the graph here, at 30 years, you have a 72% chance of having money that will last throughout your retirement. Current thinking among financial planners varies. Some would rather see you a lot closer uh, to 100%, like 80 or 90. There are some, though, that think it's not really a question of the probability of success. It's how bad are the failures that might happen. If this individual has a lot of guaranteed annual income from a pension and Social Security, Failure might not be that drastic. It would mean that maybe they've used up their retirement savings in their 401k and IRAs and so forth, but they still have income that might be enough for them to live on. Um, so, but this is a tool to let you figure out kind of where you stand. So that took us through month seven or task seven, whichever way you want to look at it. The, um, the, approach that I'm going to ask you to take changes a little bit for months eight, nine, and 10. Instead of asking you to do things that are really quite as hands-on and, and quite as intended to help you make changes or make decisions, for months eight, nine, and 10, what I really want you to do is to familiarize yourself with three areas of your finances. The first is the types of insurance that you have. The second is what, if any, estate planning you have done and what is that? And third is familiarizing yourself with your income taxes. So for month eight, there's a worksheet uh, that I want you simply to record information about the types of insurance that you have. Most people, if you have an automobile legally, you have to have auto insurance. Um, if you're a homeowner, you really, re whether or not you have a mortgage that requires you to have homeowner's insurance, you really have to have homeowner's insurance. The risk is too great not to, uh, not to, and to put that valuable asset at risk. Um, if you're a renter, maybe you have renter's insurance. Um, if you're someone who has built up um, some, um, some net worth, uh, you might have taken an umbrella insurance policy. It's a liability policy that, that expands the liability coverages in your auto and homeowners policies. You may have a personal disability insurance policy, or you may have some type of disability coverage through your employer, long-term care, term or whole life, what your health plan is, there's a place here for you to note which types of insurance you have, who your company is, what the policy number is, and then this form, you know, keeps going on across to the right, where you would put down what is the policy coverages, um, is there a deductible, for example, homeowners and auto have deductibles, long-term care and disability policies have a waiting period that serves the same function making you pay a certain amount out of pocket before the insurance kicks in. 
I'll ask you to make a note of what the annual cost of those insurances is. And in case you're in a situation where you feel like you're really going to have to cut back on expenses, uh, there's a column for you to rank these different types of insurance by how important you think they are. So again, this really isn't forcing you into making any decisions. It's about building awareness. What insurance do you have? What kind of coverages do you have? For example, you're on your auto, you know, are you 35 and you've still got the same policy you, you, you took out uh, when you got your first car on your own at age 21 and your liability coverages are like, you know, 30,000 per, per person and 60,000 per accident, which won't even replace some people's cars if you hit somebody and total their vehicle, much less pay for any damages to the, to the person and loss of income. Um, now, in the next month, estate planning is the focus. And again, a, a pretty simple worksheet here that lists uh, in, the, in the green column to the left, most of the types of um, documents that we use to do estate planning so that you can say if you've done if you've done these when was it written when was it last reviewed and if those dates either of them are too long ago it means a review is needed and then information about you know who who did your name as your agent or your uh, your representative for each of these types of documents um, and one of the, uh, again, one of the uh, programs in our series uh, for the over these four months is a state, it's called a state planning toolbox. And we'll be talking in detail to get you comfortable with, you know, what is a will? What is a trust? What's the power of attorney? What's the terminology that's used uh, so that you'll understand the meaning of those um, and understand how to, you know, how to use these to accomplish uh, your goals. But this is just a place to collect information about what is right now. One thing uh, that you'll, there's a space further down on the form for you to put here is um, some estate planning that you might have done without even realizing it. Do you own property jointly with your spouse or maybe jointly with somebody else? If it's joint tenants with right of survivorship, that actually says what happens to that property when one owner dies. The survivor automatically owns it. Do you have retirement accounts where you've named beneficiaries? That is estate planning and that has to be uh, looked at in combination with these other tools to make sure that all those things work uh, in sync with each other instead of in conflict. And then month 10 is about getting familiar with your tax return. To be honest, this is one that you may want to pull up uh, to right now, either this month or next month when you're likely going to be working on your on your taxes. Uh, or if you're a bit of a procrastinator, uh, of course, that could be March or April. Um, Again, the purpose is not really to show you how to do your taxes, but it's to begin to familiarize you with the things that impact your taxes. Oh, I didn't realize I had to pay tax on the interest in my accounts. I didn't realize that I don't pay interest on something else. I didn't realize that I have to pay tax income tax on unemployment income. Um, so that's the purpose of the worksheet for this month um, is just to have you look at your tax return, uh, the most recent one that you did, and pull some numbers from it onto the worksheet to help you understand what drives how much income you are reporting and those things that allow you to, um, to offset that income with employer benefits and other things. Now, Month 11, bit of a shift in focus here. So far, other than the estate planning, um, the things that we've been working with are sort of static. Um, they, don't, they don't change in and of themselves unless we make them change. But that's not really how life goes, is it? Life sometimes just comes at us with surprises, both good and bad. And so for month 11, I'm going to ask you to, to be, be a bit of a forecaster and to look into your future, you know, maybe five years down the road and ask yourself, what are life changes that are relatively likely to occur for you? And what would be the financial impact of those events? Now, I'm not talking about a real sophisticated analysis here. I'm just talking about sort of a 
high level, oh, if this happened, it would be bad. If this happened, it would be pretty good. So the kinds of things that could happen to you are very varied. You could have a child. You could get married. You could get divorced. Um, you could lose a spouse uh, through, through death. Um, you might have a major health problem. Uh, you might go through what a person near and dear to me has gone through in the last few months, which was uh, a not totally unexpected major surgery, but one that she had hoped to not happen. Unfortunately, there have been serious complications. And here, four months later, her recovery is still far from over. So I'm going to ask you to think about what kinds of events could be in your future, good and bad. And then to sort of do a quick and dirty analysis of what impact that would have on various aspects of your finances. Now, I'm going to pick one event for us to use as an example here, and it's a happy one for most people anyway, uh, and that is uh, the birth of a child. Uh, we're all elated. This is a, a glorious thing. Um, that doesn't mean that it's great for your financial situation. So let's, let's run through this. All you're going to do is for each of these categories, you're going to say, is having a baby a good thing, which would get a smiley face, kind of a non-issue, which is the straight line mouth, or not a good thing, or you just don't know. What does having a baby do to your expenses? Well, I don't actually have personal experience, but I am told it has a huge impact on expenses. Although having a baby may be great, as far as finances go, you'd have to circle that frowny face. What about debt? Well, it's probably not going to be a good thing for your debt because having more expenses is going to make it more likely that you'll go into debt and less likely that you'll be able to pay down debt. So at best, it would get a straight line mouth and it might get a frowny face as well. Credit history, not necessarily going to have a direct impact there. Net worth, well, probably, again, at least a straight line mouth and maybe a frowny face. Um, as far as income during your working years, well, if you end up taking time off uh, with that child and it's unpaid time off, there'll be an impact there. But then you get on down here to something like insurance and it's like, Oh my gosh, yes, I got to add that add that baby to my health insurance. Estate plan, oh, I really have to get serious about this. Now I really have to get a will done because if something were to happen to me, that will is where I can name the guardian that I would like to nominate for this child. And then, you know, what would it have to do with income taxes and so on and so forth. So just a quick and dirty sort of, like I said, a high level uh thought-provoking process about what would the financial impact be of any given event that might be coming up in your future. Like I said, five years is often a good length of time to look out. If your life is changing a lot, maybe you only want to think about the next couple of years as far as what events might be in your future. Now, month 12 is a place to maybe reflect just a bit and ask yourself, thinking about these different areas of finances, is there a place that I need help? I need assistance. And I, and I don't mean a handout. I mean uh, guidance. And so for month 12, my suggestion is for you to think about the different types of advice that are available, anything from debt counseling to high-level financial planning. Um, and I have a worksheet for you to that kind of maps those out for you, identifies the type of professionals uh, who would who would provide the kind of guidance that you may be looking for. And then on a second, not a worksheet, it's more of a fact sheet. Um, I try to educate you a little bit about the different those different types of professionals and give you some some links and some tips about how to evaluate them. Um, all financial uh, consultants or um, financial so-called experts are not created equal, and this is a place where you really have to do your own due diligence to be sure that you're choosing not only someone who is competent and ethical, but also just a good fit for you. And so this can be a very important step. Uh, if you have identified an area where you need assistance. And it could be something as straightforward as 
you're just not comfortable doing your own taxes and you're looking for a tax preparer. Uh, it could be something that that straightforward. So that's the wrap up. That's month 12 or task number 12. So I'll just remind you that all the worksheets I've talked about, whether they're ones that I created or whether they're from the Savings Fitness Workbook are all on the on the web page. One of the challenges you'll face is staying motivated. So I'll remind you again that if you can find a buddy, that may well help you. You may also want to pick a particular day of the month or, you know, day of the week that you're going to spend some time uh, on these tasks and put it on your calendar. Um, and then make sure that you have decided where's the home for the information that you're pulling together. Uh, you can't put things away if you haven't identified a home for them. If we were in a person face-to-face uh, -face class, I would have actually brought file folders to give each of you so that you would have a file folder to get you started. So pick out a file folder that you can recognize it on site, you know, it's a unique color, or you put a picture on the front of it or whatever, or set up that dedicated folder uh, on your desktop or in your documents um, section of your, your computer so that you're all set as you're working on these worksheets, as you're playing around with these calculators, you've got a place identified uh, to put those. And um, so for all of the links that I'm talking about, um, if you go to the general website to KarenChanFinancialEd.com, like most websites, there are tabs that go across the top. Click on resources and from the list that pops up, choose 12 months to take charge of my finances. And on that page, you will find um, links to the Savings Fitness book that you can download in its entirety or even order the book. Also, there are online versions of the worksheets from uh, Savings Fitness where you can do it interactively online. Uh, maybe you're more comfortable with that. Uh, maybe you'd rather have the hard copy uh, either way. But this will get you to all the tools that we've talked about today. Um, one other thing uh, you'll notice uh, on the web page is that um, there are links to resources from the other programs I teach as well. And there's a page called Contact Karen, where if you'd like to know where I'm presenting in the future uh, beyond uh, here at Elk Grove uh, Village Library, um, you can sign up for quarterly notices of those and you can simply review uh, a list of the other places where I'm teaching over the next two or three months. So we've covered a lot of territory here. Um, Nancy, do we have some questions come in that we should address now? Um, so I haven't received any questions yet. I just typed in there, does anybody have any questions for Karen? So please feel free to um, speak up and type them here. And I'm sure that Karen, you're, do you take questions by email too, or do you prefer to have people uh, post it, yes, it, questions instead here? Um, the, if you go, uh, if you go to the web page, that same place I said where you could ask to receive notices about oh, sorry, um, yes. my upcoming, it's called Contact Karen, and there's a text box there where you can ask me a question. If it's a factual question, I try to answer it. If it's an advice question, you know, if you're asking me what you should do in a certain situation, I'll probably push back and say, uh, sorry, I'm not licensed to do that. Um, but a factual question like, how how do I do something, where do I find this information? What's the rule about this or that? Those kinds of questions I try to answer uh, as they come through. And the fact that we don't have any questions right now, I have a feeling that if we could see everybody's faces, we might see the kind of face that isn't unusual in financial classes like this. We might see these rather <laughs> dumbfounded, blank, expressionless faces because you're just trying to absorb all the things that we've been talking about. Um, but sure. yeah, I think there's a lot you I mean, this is like a lot to work on. And so if, if, if somebody hasn't gone through all of this before, you, you're thinking about all the all the um, digging in that you can start doing and uh, learning more about what your situation is and getting a handle on it. So there's a lot there to work on. <laughs> yeah. Oh, so um, uh, let's see. Um, yes, this is being recorded so that you would be able to so question popped up. Um, this will be available on our library website, egvpl.org. Um, 
under, I think it's called Library on Demand. But um, if you'll just give me until next week, there's a little bit of processing of the video that is required and then our IT person has to get them up, up on the website. But it'll be there on the website for you to view later. Um, there was a comment on uh, very helpful and uh, very absorbing, <laughs> a lot of information, somebody said. So um, I'll, please feel free to keep tight. You know, if you have a question, put that in. I just wanted to mention too, I have these um, notebooks. Karen was talking about um, having uh, everything in one place, your folder. And I wanted to offer a notebook like this to anybody who would like one, if you want to use something like this as like your kind of notebook for um, writing down questions or any research that you're doing. It's got a cool little packet in the front and it's kind of like a padded notebook. Some of you have all these already, I know, but um, um, we have plenty. So if you would like one, you can um, send me an email. Uh, I'll just put my email address here. Um, send me an email and say you'd like a notebook and I'll make one available to you at the curbside pickup. You can pick that up. And um, I also wanted to just type also, I see Karen, you know what, there's a couple questions in, um, there's a couple questions in our Q and A. So hold on. Okay. Um, so a person asked, do you recommend paying bills lowest balance to highest balance or higher interest rate first? That's a really good question. And it's, it's a good question because the recommendation has changed. When I was first learning about debt repayment, it, it was always very clearly stated. Any extra dollars, you just have to put them toward the debt that has the highest interest rate. It's going to get you the most bang for your buck. You know, it'll save you the most and, and interest charges over time. And that was the standard recommendation for years. Over the last maybe five years, some of the thinking has changed because there's this new field um, called behavioral finance or behavioral economics, which looks at how our brains process decisions and how our brains react to various things. And what we've learned is our brains really do experience reward uh, from paying off debt. And so the sooner you can pay off your first debt, the more likely you are to succeed in paying off the rest of them because you're, you're retraining your brain, literally. You've probably trained your brain up to this point to talk to you like this. You're a debtor. You're always going to be a debtor. You know, it's, it's just being a you know, real downer for you. But when you pay off that first debt, your brain kind of perks up and goes, oh, well, look at that. Maybe, maybe you can pay off all these debts. And so getting that success feeling as soon as possible is now considered to be perhaps a, a, as important and maybe more important than putting the additional money toward the highest interest debt. Now, um, each person may, you know, can, can, there's no wrong answer there really though, as long as you're putting the additional dollars toward debt uh, and, and continuing to work toward that goal, there's no bad answer here. Um, so, but those really are your two choices. The one you can pay off the fastest, the one with the highest interest rate. If they happen to be one in the same, cool. And you can play around with PowerPay to see what difference it will make. I have seen examples where the two approaches really only differ by maybe a couple of months in how long it will take you to pay things off. And so the dollar amount could be different, could be quite different depending on your exact scenario. And so that might be one piece of it too. Use PowerPay and see how much of a difference will it make? Which one do I think I'll be most successful with? Um, a person said, um, I think this is, in, uh, this is in relation to what you're saying. I have two other questions too, but in relation to what you were just saying, the person said, a big trend now seems to be to pay like half your payment right right away and then the other half um, when due to trick the interest rate. I think maybe they're saying to keep um, rather than just paying once a month to keep, you know, pay more frequently. I think um, depending, okay, depending on how the interest is being calculated and so forth. Yeah, that there may be advantages there. There may be lenders who, um, don't handle that well. Um, but the one situation where I have seen people do this 
to um, to avoid uh, it's to avoid a particular problem. So let me let me ex describe this for a minute, and we, we would get more into detail on on this in our um, credit history on and credit score program that's coming up. But one of the main drivers of your credit score is the utilization ratio, meaning of the credit line you have on any given credit card. How much of that credit line are you using uh, on the day that your credit score is calculated? Higher is worse. If you're actually, if you have a $10,000 credit limit and you've got $8,000 charged on it, that's 80% utilization. That's it's really horrible, to be honest. You want to be more like 15%, 30% at the most. Well, there are situations where somebody does something really dramatic, like my husband and I actually paid for a funeral once uh, with our credit card, knowing that the money would be coming back from my mother-in-law the next month and we paid it off. But at that particular time, my, uh, my utilization ratio was about 90 to 95%. My insurance renewed that month. I got a notice from my insurance company saying, sorry, we don't think you look like such a good risk anymore. We're going to charge you more for your insurance. So people who find themselves in a situation like that may try to pay a good chunk of it before the due date there, trying to avoid getting a bad utilization ratio. Um, I think this person probably was talking more about trying to reduce the amount of interest that's owed. But like I said, you really have to kind of know how your lender is calculating those things in order to be sure if it's going to, to uh, help you or not. Okay, okay so um, person is asking for a couple of key points to consider when looking for a financial consultant. Okay, it's interesting that that they use the term financial consultant. It's kind of like you knew I was going to talk about some of the other terms. Um, financial consultants is not a legally regulated term. Financial planner is not a legally regulated term. So step one is understanding how financial professionals are regulated. Tax preparers fall under one category. Financial planners or investment advisors, that, that in that pot, legally, you have two categories. You have brokers and you have investment advisors. Brokers are regulated as salespeople. Investment advisors are regulated with the idea that they actually do give advice. Over time, though, what's happened is... Um, Brokers have begun to act like investment advisors, but the regulatory environment hasn't changed with that. Why is that important? If somebody's giving you financial advice and you think they're an investment advisor, an investment advisor is required to put your best, best interests first. It's called being a fiduciary. That's how investment advisors are regulated. Brokers, since the law assumes that they are salespeople, doesn't hold them to that high standard. They're only held to the standard of suitability. Whatever they recommend for investments has to be suitable. Suitable sounds good until you compare it with best. So there's a, a bit of a gap there. That's one thing to know. The other thing is um, evaluating the person's training and competence. And often you do that by looking at credentials. Now, there are some credentials out there that are pretty much meaningless. But there are others like the certified financial planner designation uh, that indicates um, six college level classes of work. Uh, it used to be a two day exam. I think it's only a one day exam now. Uh, the pass rate though is around 60%. You look for things like that. You look for people like maybe a, a CPA who is is a personal financial specialist, a, a, an additional uh, category with them being a CPA. So you look for, you look for what are they legally and what does that mean about their responsibility to you? You look at their competence. You also look for communication. And, uh, and one of the programs that I haven't taught it in quite a long time, but one of the programs that I have taught is called Finding Financial Advice That's Right for You. And so if you go to the resources tab um, on the web page and look for 
finding financial advice. You'll find links to all of the resources that I used uh, to create that program. And I think it will help you, this individual investigate, again, the types of financial advisors. What does it mean if they're labeled this way? What does it mean if they're labeled that way? And there are even links to suggested sets of interview questions to help you evaluate someone that you might be considering, as well as links to sources of names where you can search for individuals and kind of begin to figure out who does what and who you might be interested in. Okay. okay. Um, another question is, is it better to use a fee only financial advisor? Um, some people will say this is totally a non-controversial uh, area. And of course, you want to work with a fee only planner. And some people will say that it is somewhat controversial. Um, so I'll give you this is sort of my personal take. Although I will say that the, the, the popular press, the media is pretty much on the same page with this as well. Um, if someone is working on commission, there is, there is a conflict of interest in them giving you advice about what you should do and then selling you the product to fulfill that advice. We know that that happens at a car dealership. Nobody expects a car dealer to help them compare their car with another uh, manufacturer's car and be unbiased about it, right? I mean, we know what we're getting there. Um, but it's not quite so clear sometimes with, uh, with finance. Now, so fee only means that the person sells no product. They only sell advice and that that is what you're paying them for. Um, that is generally believed to be, to have fewer conflicts of interest than someone who is paid based on product sales. Does that mean that you could, that someone who sells product isn't going to be a good financial advisor for you? No, it just means that you have less certainty about the basis of some of their advice. Now, having said that, one indicator of the value of their advice is Remember, I talked about registered investment advisors versus brokers. And by the way, brokers technically, legally, are known as registered representatives. If this financial advisor who perhaps sells mutual funds, perhaps sells um, annuities, perhaps sells uh, insurance products, if they are regulated as a registered investment advisor, they do have a fiduciary responsibility to you. They are legally supposed to put your interests first. And so even though their compensation model is, um, is commission, they should be serving the higher standard. You should be fine there. Um, but if you're in a, in a different situation, um, you know, with somebody who is strictly insurance, there's, they're not held to that type of standard like an investment advisor, then you have to be a little more careful. You know, are, are, they, are they telling me what's best for me or is it based on which, is, which product is gonna pay them the highest commission? I kind of went around the world on that question, I apologize. Unfortunately, the US regulatory system does not make it easy for consumers uh, to differentiate among the types of financial advisors that are out there. It's nice to hear your whole, the longer answer though, to hear, <laughs> to hear exactly where you're coming from and you know to get the full answer like that's good. Um, one more question was, um, or a comment or question, about uh, the tab on your website regarding upcoming programs. Is that up to date? And I think I looked at it and it was. Um, uh, and it I just did it yesterday, so <laughs> it but should be. Is this an alternative to receiving the email? So I'm not sure, did, were, were you? So I have an email that I send out and I'm not sure if she's talking about a different email. Maybe they're talking about, uh, I, I mentioned, uh, like it says on this slide, that if you wanted to sign up for notices right. about upcoming workshops. So, so yeah, there are, there are two ways to learn about upcoming programs 
from me. One is via email if you sign up for that. The other is checking the website. I will tell you that as far as the website goes, where the li- where I have the list of upcoming programs, I do not update it monthly. I'll be honest. It gets updated generally quarterly, generally when I am preparing to send out that email to people who've asked to receive it. So um, so you, if, if you go and you see that the, the presentations listed up there are out of date, it probably means I don't have anything coming up right away, like over the holidays. You know, I just didn't update it. Um, so check back. It does eventually get updated, um, but it's not on a weekly or monthly basis. It's more like a quarterly basis. Okay, great. And I, put, I just typed in chat um, the website address of our um, Elk Grove Library Money Smart website, which um, there's some information about Karen there. But then I also, over the many years that we've been doing Money Smart, I've been kind of collecting our topics there, as well as good resources that we found along the way. Um, and if you want to take a look at that website at some point, and uh, if there's other topics that you're interested in, there may be some resources of interest to you there. Um, So otherwise, I also typed in the chat that our next program, February 18th, is with Karen, and that is the topic of um, credit history, credit score, and identity identity theft protection. And then March 18th is the 10 Steps to a Smarter Tax Return. And then our April program is um, the the Estate Planning Toolbox. So... Um, all very interesting topics, and I hope you'll join us uh, again for those. They're generally the third Thursday of the month, except for the April one. That is a different, that's April 8th, I think it is. So that's all listed on Karen's website as well, though. And and Nancy, some of them are daytime programs, are they not? Uh, Let me check. I think that we have them all as evening ones. Okay. I think they're all evening ones for us. Okay. Yes. So, in the and on Karen's website as well as you know, she gave me she sent a handout of it of all those as well that I can send to you anybody if you want if you want that. But it's the same thing that's on your website. Um, it's great that you know I love public libraries so much, <laughs> and so the you know she's all these programs that she's doing at other public libraries. You are welcome to sign up for those as well. I actually just signed up for one offered by uh, Vernon Area Public Library that Karen is doing in February called Money Skills for Tough Times, Monday, Monday February eighth. So that's kind of the beauty of. Um, one of the silver linings of this time of uh, Zoom programming is that you know you're no longer limited by your location necessarily. <laughs> so we're thankful for some. Got to be thankful for the things that there are to be thankful for. Right, right. You know, it t- it took most libraries a couple of months to kind of you know get geared up for the new environment, but um, it's. Uh, it's been amazing to me you know, the the, the um, amount of services that that my local library uh, and the libraries that I partner with for these kinds of programs. You know the amount of of work you've done gearing up to uh, to continue serving your patrons like this. So so high five to all the libraries, <laughs> you know, and to and to Elk Grove and and to Nancy uh, here today. Well, thank you. And thank you, Karen. It was nice to see you. And we'll see you again in February. I hope you all can join us again. And if you have any questions or comments or ideas along the way, um, please feel free to email me as well at nbroughton at edvpl.org. And uh, I I send the chat there (laughs) somewhere if you take a look. Um, So with that, I think we'll sign off. And I wish everybody... uh, Good evening and a good rest of your week and take care and stay healthy. Okay. Okay. So we'll see you next time. All right. Thanks Karen for your your time and expertise. Okay. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.